This video is going to cover proteomics, which is fairly similar in content to understanding RNA-seq or drop-seq or any of the other large-scale methods that we have discussed so far. So this video is really going to be a fairly short overview of how proteomics is different from those and what the key points are to understand with proteomics screens. Let's start by reviewing the central dogma of biology. So we've talked about this before, and I think you're all aware of the idea in biology that DNA forms RNA, which forms protein. But let's just go through this step by step just to make sure we really understand what's going on. So you can imagine that you have DNA in your cell, and this is your double-stranded DNA that we always see in the cell. Um, and then this gets transcribed, so transcription occurs. And that generates, as you all know, that generates mRNA. And this is your single-stranded version. So this is going to be single-stranded. It's going to have the base U instead of T. And this is what is going to actually migrate out of the nucleus in order to be converted to protein. So we talked about before how mRNA is the measure of which genes are actually being turned on in the cell. But we also talked about how mRNA can sometimes be degraded or it can just cycle back on itself or is not translated. And so while it is a measure of all of the genes that are being turned on, it is not a perfect measure of all the proteins that will be expressed. We also talked before about how we sometimes use mRNA to generate the DNA. We reverse engineer it in the lab. And that's for sequencing applications and other applications that really require a DNA sample to start. So assuming that it doesn't get degraded and it doesn't become cDNA, mRNA, the next step, is going to be translation. So this is where the single strand of mRNA is going to be translated into our protein sample. And so our protein is a chain of polypeptides. That's how it starts. And every three mRNA bases get converted to one amino acid, as I'm sure you all are aware. Methionine is typically the starting amino acid, and then there will be some sort of stop codon. There's UAA, UAG, there's a few iterations of stop codons, and so that will tell the polypeptide chain to stop growing. And this is sort of your initial protein sample. So now that we have this chain of polypeptides that we just talked about, this is our chain of amino acids right here, together called a polypeptide. Now we're interested in knowing how this turns into an actual protein in the cell. So this is called primary protein structure, where it's just a long chain of amino acids. And this is considered sort of the denatured or unfolded state of the protein. We then can get a secondary structure on this, where it will form these two types of structures. So it can form into either helices or sheets. And that those are the two main structures that we care about. So a helix is called an alpha helix, and that's basically this helical, almost DNA or RNA-like structure. And then a beta pleated sheet is sort of a sheet that goes like zigzags. Um, and those are your two main secondary structures that the amino acids will form into. And then those can further fold or come together to form even more significant structures. So the way you'd understand this is that perhaps one section of the protein would coil into an alpha helix and another section of the protein might coil into a beta pleated sheet and so on. So within one protein, you can have multiple iterations of these alpha and beta structures. After that, we're going to go on to our tertiary structure. And so like I just showed you, the alpha helices and beta sheets sort of exist together in each protein. And we can see here that now we're getting some three-dimensional folding. So before we were just getting a sheet or a pleat in one place, but now the protein is really coming together and forming bonds right here. Um, so they form bonds sort of between the sheets and between the helices, and that sort of allows it to become a 3D structure. And then finally, we're going to form quaternary structures. And that's your final protein that can actually act in the cell. And often these consist of more than one amino acid chain. So an example of this is hemoglobin, which has two alpha units and two beta units in every hemoglobin. 
And so that's actually four different amino acid chains coming together to form one protein. And that is quite common in the cell. So here we see one light gray amino acid chain that is folded and one dark gray one that has folded and they're coming together to form your final protein. It's also it's important also to realize that there are often what's called post-translational modifications on these proteins. And so those are little tags, sometimes phosphorylation um, or other sorts of modifications that allow the protein to act in certain ways in the cell. So sometimes proteins require phosphorylation to become active. Sometimes they require other modifications to be able to execute their functions in the cell. And sometimes those modifications actually turn them off. So it's just important to realize that while this is the structure of the protein, there are multiple forms and modifications of this that all have different functions. So this is an example of what we just talked about, which is the post-translational modifications and the DNA to RNA to protein transition. So protein structures are far, far more complex than mRNA. And so far, we've talked about ways to measure mRNA levels. So if you imagine you have your genome, and that goes to your transcriptome, right, which can form all of these different mRNA transcripts, which are genes that are being turned on. But then all of those transcripts, each transcript can fold multiple ways with multiple post-translational modifications in order to become a protein. And so your complexity is going up significantly over time or sorry, over your DNA to RNA to protein um, transition because you have so many more options at every single stage for what you can make. And so we go from a known set of approximately 22,000 genes to over a million proteoforms, and even that might be too low of an estimate. So this really makes measuring protein far more complex than measuring DNA or RNA. So now we can sort of get to proteomics and make sure we understand that. So proteomics is a high throughput way, extremely high throughput because we're looking at all the proteins, not just one. And it's important to remember that because there are other ways to measure just one or two proteins. So this is our way to measure all proteins in the cell. And that is what we've kind of said here in a cell or a tissue. And the technology it uses is called mass spectrometry, which we'll get into in just a second. But what you want to remember is if you are interested in an experiment where you want to unbiasedly or blindly measure every single protein in a certain condition, proteomics is going to be your go-to. So now that we understand what a proteomics screen is, let's talk a little bit about how to set it up. And you'll notice that this is very, very similar to other experiments that we've talked about. You're basically going to choose a model of interest. You're going to expose it to some sort of control and experimental condition, perhaps multiple. And you're going to generate a protein sample that you can then send off to get the screen performed for you. So for our models, like we've talked about before, we can use cells. We can also use animals. And we can also use human tissue samples if we're able to get a hold of them. Basically, it's anything that you could make protein out of. You can send it for a proteomic screen if you would like. So once you've picked your model of interest or your biological sample of interest, you are going to then expose it to certain conditions. So this will be the part where you're actually performing your experiments. So you're going to always have your control condition. Remember, you must always, always have good controls. And you're going to expose it to some sort of treatment condition. And this can be a drug change, it can be a time change, it can be, like we've talked about before, primary versus recurrent, any sort of control versus experimental condition. But as always, you want to make sure you have the closest control possible to your experimental condition because when you do these large-scale screens, you really don't want anything else to be able to throw off your results. So you want to make sure that everything is the same except for that small experimental change that you're making. So then we're going to move on and we're going to extract our protein. And we've talked already about the fact that you have DNA to RNA to protein and so every cell and tissue is going to have protein in it. And once you extract that protein, you are able to send it to the next step, which is going to be to perform max spectrometry. 
and we'll talk a little bit more about mass spectrometry and how exactly it works, but this is usually something that you are able to send off. So it's not usually something that you do in your lab unless you have the equipment necessary to do that kind of experiment. Usually you will get to the protein point, which is a standard extraction protocol a lot of labs do, and then you're just going to send the sample to a core at your university or um, another facility that allows that kind of analysis. So now we've sent off our sample. So we made our sample. We sent it off to mass spec. And now it's come back to us. And it's come back as sort of this table of counts, right? So we can compare this to previous pipelines we've discussed, which are fairly similar. So RNA-seq, you do a very similar setup and you send your mRNA converted to cDNA for sequencing. You then get your quality analysis, which you can do. You get your count table and you perform these algorithms on it and generate visualizations. And then you're able to choose genes of interest. So this pipeline is something we've discussed at length. And as you can imagine, it's very, very similar for a proteomic screen. So if we think about proteomics, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to send it, but we're going to send it for mass spec instead of sequencing. Usually the quality analysis necessary is performed by the facility, but you can always perform additional checks to make sure that your samples are similar, replicates are similar, all those types of things. And you're really going to have a count table at the end from the facility that says you have protein X and you have three copies and protein Y, you have four copies and so on. And then you're going to perform algorithms to analyze what these changes mean and how significant are these changes. And the algorithm is called Tweedy-Seq or Wilcoxon, which is very, very similar to the DE-Seq2 algorithm that's used for RNA-Seq. And in proteomics, the visualizations, because the algorithm is so similar, are actually the same. And so we're going to use heat maps and volcano plots again, which you're all very familiar with from the RNA-Seq video. If you're not, I would highly recommend that you watch the RNA-Seq video to understand these visualizations better. And then once you have those heat maps and volcano plots and the p-values, you can always choose specific genes of interest based on your screen results and usually based on other supporting data as well. So let's just talk about one key difference. We just talked about how RNA-seq and proteomics, the pipeline is very similar, and it is. But one key difference to keep in mind is that the technology we're using instead of next generation sequencing is now mass spectrometry. And in this technology, basically the idea is that you are separating ions based on their mass and their charge. And so this is a simple diagram here of what a mass spectrometer looks like. Your sample is going to enter and it's basically going to be deflected by the magnet. And the amount of deflection is going to be inversely proportional to its mass over charge ratio. And that allows us to identify what that particle is. And so once we have the deflections, they are sort of plotted on this graph, this kind of graph, where we have our atomic mass, or usually for our biology, m over z ratio, and you have the relative abundance. And so this gives you a abundance calculation, which is a quantity calculation, and a specific type of protein calculation. So you get both what proteins are present and quantitatively how much is there. And that's really all you need to be able to figure out what is the balance of protein in a cell and how is it changing. So your peaks are going to be the isotopes or types of protein that are present, and your height is going to be the abundance, and that's how you interpret this graph. So this is a graph for zirconia, and we can see that, for example, zirconia 90 is the most abundant because it's the tallest, but that there are five different isotopes or forms of zircon that are naturally occurring and that we can see in different abundances in nature. So this is meant to be a simple example to illustrate how mass spec can give you results, and this is really what I would focus on for understanding it. You don't need to understand the physics details of what's going on here, but you do need to understand that your abundance is measured by how high the peak is and isotopes by how many there are. So if we move on and look at this in actual biological samples rather than zircon, you can see that what we've talked about is mostly represented on this diagram. So we have 
our sample, which can be cultures or tissues. We extract our protein right here. And then we're going to digest and form polypeptides right here. And we're going to analyze those by mass spectrometry. And as I talked about, you have this M over Z ratio on your X axis and then your percent abundance on your Y axis. When you compare two MS spectra to each other, you get what's called an MS-MS plot, and that reflects the relative abundance of one sample over the other, rather than the raw abundance ratio. And then you're able to analyze your data, and you're able to identify genes that you might be interested in pursuing. So a key extension of the idea of being able to do mass spec is that sometimes when you want to do mass spec on a specific group of proteins, that is defined by the group of proteins that binds to another protein. So for example, there are many, many protein interactions in the cell. So let's say that I have notch one, which is a protein in the cell. And I know that notch one binds to X and to Y and to Z and to W, because they're all proteins that it binds to. And I wanna know that between DMSO and TMZ, how is X changing? So what's going on with these proteins across these conditions? But I wanna first specifically isolate those proteins that bind only to notch and then look at those proteins and how they're changing. So this might be useful if you wanted to understand what the effect is of notch binding on cells with TMZ, right? It allows you to do that dual condition. So the way that works is you use an antibody to first bind to notch and isolate that. And because that because notch is already bound to X, Y, Z, and W, those interactions will come with the notch protein when you pull it down. So here you see that X and Y are bound together. And if I use beads with an antibody on them that's specific to X, it's going to pull down only all the proteins that are X and things that are bound to X. So in this case, it would be it would pull down all the proteins that were notch one or that were notch one bound to something. And then I can go ahead and do MS on just this protein sample that has only the things that are notch one or notch one bound to something. And then I would only isolate these proteins that are binding and be able to see how that binding is changing between two conditions. So this is really a really useful way to understand how proteins interact in cells, and it's very, very commonly used in the lab. If you want more information on this, we're going to discuss it even further when we talk about CHIP and other IP applications, but being able to pull one protein down and then examine how it binds to other proteins is a very common thing in biology and one that is important to understand. And then just as you know, as something to point out, like we do global proteomics, we could also imagine that we would do single cell proteomics, just the way we've talked about RNA-seq. And so this is a technology that's sort of up and coming where you can barcode single cells in the same way that we've talked about RNA-seq and measure them one by one and learn what the protein levels are in every single cell. So this is up and coming, but you could imagine that it would have a lot of power and something that would really allow us to expand our understanding of how proteins are changing within populations within samples. So now just to review and go back, um, we've talked about four major gene screening techniques at this point. We've talked about CRISPR, which is a really good way to understand gene functionality. We've talked about RNA-seq, which is a global mRNA expression tool. We've talked about drop-seq, which is our single cell expression. And then we've also talked about proteomics, which is going to be specifically for protein. So a good way to make sure that you really understand these techniques would be to think about what's a research question that you might ask for each of these. So now that you have some background in GBM, you know what genes are important and what the issues are you might try to consider what would I want to do a CRISPR screen for or what would I want to do an RNA-seq experiment for because that helps you understand how to design experiments when you're actually faced with a research question in the lab. It's also important to understand the pros and cons of every method. So for example, CRISPR screens and drop-seq experiments can be very time-consuming 
and require a lot of specialized knowledge, whereas RNA-seq and proteomics can usually be sent out to cores and are relatively easy to perform. So you do want to think about the capabilities of your lab and the time constraints and sort of what exactly your experiment requires when you choose which technique to use. So today we've talked about an overview of protein basics and how it functions in the cell. We've talked about how you would set up your proteomics screen. And we've talked a little bit about the analysis pipeline. This video is fairly short because a lot of it does derive from the RNA-seq and other screening methods we've discussed, but I hope it was a basic overview that allows you to understand when and where proteomics might be used. Um, and having those other videos as background would be very helpful, so if you haven't watched those, definitely watch them. And then we'll also talk more about IP reactions and other ways to measure protein and cells in future lectures. So that will also be helpful to review for more context. So that's it for proteomics. Um, this video is supported by the Ahmed Lab. And if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact us using any of these methods. Thank you so much for listening.